very early on, Mark and David both are at a biochem lab called Cori Children's Research Institute, and they're nearby, they're neighbors. And um, Mark is a, uh, a PhD biochemist, uh, I think quite brilliant, and um, his expertise is the gut. And, and, and he has lots of knowledge and also lots of questions that he's looking at. Varied in small portions, I think that's a great segue for uh, uh, the, the way I start thinking about uh, gut health. The, the idea of having varied uh, nutrient-dense foods in small portions actually makes a lot of sense. I'll tell you a little bit about what I do. I'm interested in, in the relationship between food and how it affects um, our gut. And I'm specifically interested in how the gut wall performs because for better or worse, the types of foods that we consume in our diet can both irritate and nurture to the point of making it stronger. So the typical American diet with high fat content uh, serves as a way of uh, irritating the GI tract to the point where you get these, flex these uh, uh, holes in it. We call it leaky gut or, or intestinal permeability. And the idea of lowering the amount of food by in, uh, lowering it to small portions, making it more frequent and making it more diverse, actually makes a lot of sense because the way the gut wall works is that you have to supply it with a variety of um, components. You can think of the cells that line the gut as a little factory. And the output of that factory or its manufacturing output is dependent upon all the uh, parts, the nutrients that we derive from our diet. By lowering the amount of food to small portions, what you're doing is you're lowering the physical impact and you're enabling the enzymes to digest it in a way that it can handle it. So you can imagine that if you consume a large uh, diet, uh, sorry, a large portion of food, let's say you uh, take your 2,400 calories into one meal, the impact of those 2,400 calories in a single sitting is, is dramatic and enormous to the point where um, the person that is experiencing that is um, falling asleep. And why is that? Because what happens when you consume large amounts of food is that the irritation uh, due to that amount of food can cause uh, an enormous amount of stress on the gut wall, particularly when it's folded in with, with uh, dietary fat in excess. Okay, so how do you buttress or make the gut wall stress resistant so that it can enable the consumption of food in a way that's uh, measured and that is balanced and that prevents this type of permeability uh, the way you do it is you do exactly um, the way you just described, and that is that type of pattern of food consumption. Um, now, I'm interested in the reason why you want to make the gut strong. There is a, a population of gut bacteria that exists both in our large intestine and the small intestine. We're particularly interested in, in the bacteria that is, is in our small intestine because that is the site at which uh, this permeability leads to the movement of bacteria or bacterial flex. We call it macromolecules as part of the uh, cell walls of these bacteria, when they get across the gut wall, they trigger an immune response. Okay. And what hasn't been re realized up to this point is that this um, feeling of fatigue after we eat is due to the immunologic response to bacteria that is actually crossing the gut wall. So this area that, that is quickly emerging suggests that one of the reasons why we're getting tired, one of the reasons why our endocrine system is disrupted, one of the reasons why uh, the fat around our bellies expand, and the, one of the reasons why um, a lot of the metabolic disturbances that lead to rises in cholesterol, blood glucose, spikes in insulin, and the tiredness that associates uh, with this process 
is because the, the uh, permeability of the gut wall enables the movement of the bacteria and the food antigens that can provoke this immune response. So not only are we restricting the argument to the bacteria, but we're also uh, expanding it to food antigens, including the gluten that is part of the wheat that we're consuming. So whether it be bacteria, um, gluten, or the combination of those two, what ends up happening is that our immune response uh, throws out these things called inflammatory cytokines that, that hit our gut wall, or sorry, the area outside the gut to lead to an expansion uh, of the fat that we call abdominal fat. Those inflammatory cytokines are also direct to our brain. And when they hit the brain soon after we eat, it's the same type of proteins that, that rise uh, in high quantity when we're infected. And it's because of the, the rise, in the, what we call the postprandial rise in these inflammatory cytokines that we're falling asleep. So this concept of food coma is not because we're eating large quantities of, of food, it's because we're eating large quantities of food that's improperly balanced, that's irritating in physical quality, and it's uh, because uh, uh, the nutrient density is lacking. Okay. Uh, one of the things that, that I've been working on with uh, the people like uh, Joe Vanderleet is this concept that there's something different about uh, the process of milling whole grain and how this may relate to uh, this idea of intestinal permeability, high spikes in insulin and glucose. And that idea is that the processing of wheat is very different. Uh, the old, I guess the old world way of processing wheat versus um, the industrialized way. So the industrialized way of taking wheat is to break it into um, different fractions, only to put it back together again. Uh, but the problem with that is that, that um, the structure of the wheat is very different. And we know that because we've, we've actually tested the quality of the wheat and the way it's processed by our uh, analytic enzymes in our saliva. So you can do test tube experiments to demonstrate uh, very large differences in the way whole, whole wheat grain is processed by our uh, salivary enzymes. And so this relationship between the rate of breakdown, which uh, occurs at a very high rate with whole wheat grain that is uh, taken off the shelf, let's say from general metals like the gold metal stuff, or the what we call the, the dry milled wheat that uh, Joe provides are day and night. One breaks down very quickly, the other one breaks down in a measured manner that is uh, consistent with going small and diverse. So it's like, it's like the impacts of eating small frequent meals instead of the fast uh, excursions of glucose that occurs with something that has been already pre-broken down. So what we're I identifying in our, uh, these, uh, these pilot studies that we've been working on is that there's a fundamental difference in the quality uh, and the structure of the wheat that is provided from uh, uh, the industrialized process versus the old world process that Joe and others use. And so then the key question is, if you start thinking about um, areas of the world that use the old world process, uh, such as areas of France, and I hear this all the time, by the way, because uh, uh, Craig Ponsford, who is part of this uh, community grains group, is now in France, and he says, yeah, when I eat bread here in the United States, I get uh, gastrointestinal upset. I can't um, tolerate it very well, but when I go to Paris, I can eat as much as I want. So what is the difference between that? And when people take uh, Joe Vanderleet's wheat, prepare, and, Joe, and Craig prepares the bread from it, and people consume it, they experience very similar types of um, uh, responses to it. They can tolerate it, they don't get sleepy, 
And again, this is very uh, consistent with the concepts that I've been thinking about and how the, uh, the, the flower that's produced by, um, by Joe's process leads to a superior product. And I think we can prove it with uh, further clinical studies. So. Okay. That's, that's the neighborhood <laughs> microbiologist, just to say, just down the street, you know. And, and there's another one. Well, Mark forgot to use one of his favorite phrases. Mark's sort of known around Corey for his uh, little nuggets of ways of presenting things, and he calls it instead of food coma, calls it food hangover. And I think that fits really well because the hangover is the response of the body to that leaky stuff coming through the gut, which shouldn't be there. A lot of it's pretty similar. So I, I certainly have had uh, large meals where I felt um, it was more similar to a, ha a hangover than a coma. I think. Did you want to say anything more about that before? Uh, the relationship between a, a food hangover and an alcoholic hangover, it's, it's essentially the, the, the same process. Uh, it's mediated by a different, uh, a different starting point. So alcohol is uh, no different from fat. Fat is not as potent as alcohol, but when you consume alcohol, it acts just like dietary fat and acting like a detergent. What it does is it strips and it solubilizes the membranes that if the integrity is not maintained, the stuff starts flooding through. This is one of the reasons why we feel sicker than a dog the next day when we consume excess amounts of alcohol is because not, uh, you're not restricted to the amount of these gut bacteria that can be resolved by our immune system within one hour. It hangs around because the gut wall is uh, disturbed for, for, uh, for hours, if not maybe up to a day, with uh, uh, enormous amounts of alcohol intake. So the process between alcohol-induced uh, sleepiness and dietary fat-induced sleepiness is, a, is basically uh, of degree or dose. And the reason why uh, I got interested in this, in, this uh, in the first place was uh, the finding that kids were actually uh, experiencing this thing called fatty liver, kids that were of not drinking age. And, and the way they described it was non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And the reason why they were getting non-alcoholic fatty liver disease was because they were consuming uh, refined carbohydrates. And it could be in the form of soda. It could be in the form of white bread. It could be in the form of perhaps even whole grain wheat that's processed by the industrial uh, machine. Uh, uh, that, that, that's a question that we still have to think about and investigate in further detail.